pleasure to introduce Professor Katrina Liggett. Um, she's a professor at Caltech. She's been there four years, and she works on, I, I've just learned, uh, not only on differential privacy and theoretical computer science, but also economics and game theory and things like that. So uh, she feels torn between being here and listening to the tutorial next door. Um, prior to joining Caltech, uh, she got her PhD at CMU, and she did a postdoc at Cornell. Uh, okay, so since we're a bit behind schedule, I'll stop there and hand over the floor. Great, thank you. All right. So I, I know I promised this is the differential privacy tutorial, and it is the differential privacy tutorial, but for a moment, I'd like you to forget that I've said anything about privacy, and let me tell you a little story. So the story goes something like this. You, you sign your NDAs, you pass your IRBs, you write your code, you gather your data, and there finally you are, you have your data. Now what? So you're the cautious type, so you don't just dive right in and start mucking around in the data, but you're concerned about statistical validity. So you plan ahead the models that you're going to fit, the hypotheses that you're going to test, and of course, whatever you do, you're concerned about the robustness of your findings, because it'd be a real shame if just a handful of outliers could skew your results. And of course, the goal underlying everything is generalization of your results, so that you'll be relevant on future data sets. And so today, I'll be talking about a toolkit that addresses all of these and more. It just happens that this toolkit comes with a strange label. Privacy. Okay. So what's the plan here? I want to help you sort of make sense of this story that I've just told you, that privacy is really about all of these things. And the way that I'm going to do that is, well, be getting comfortable with the notion of differential privacy, working through the definition, uh, thinking about how to reason about differential privacy, uh, building up some of its appealing properties. And then I'll be giving you sort of the basic differential privacy toolkit motivated by applications and hopefully making connections for you to learning throughout the way. And then towards the end, hopefully you'll start to see it come together, and you'll start to see privacy really as a notion of stability, of robustness, and start to understand the power that it can have for validity and generalization. So let's start out with the definition. So we'll be working today in a statistical database model where we'll write x, this big x, as the set of possible entries or rows of a database, and think of each row as being a single person's data. And so we'll talk about a database as being a set of rows, which we'll frequently denote by a histogram representation. So this little x is, denoted, is denoting how many instantiations of each possible database entry there are in my database. So every possible row that could appear in the database is one of these big X, and a database is a count for each of those possibilities. And we, the analysts, show up, and what we'd like to do is compute on such a database. So when I say compute, it, I mean it very broadly. Maybe we want to fit a model, maybe we want to compute a statistic, maybe what we actually want to do is share some sanitized version of our data, and we have to figure out how to sanitize it. Uh, but our goal is going to be for our computation to mask small changes in the input database. We don't want the results of our computation to be very, very sensitive to small changes in the input database, and we'll formalize that next. But the idea is that we're going to be developing computations, which will be algorithms that map from database space, from the space of possible databases, into some outcome space. And these are mappings that, as we'll see, will necessarily be randomized. So this is what, as an analyst, we'll be developing. Is we'll be developing randomized mappings from database space to some outcome space. And like I said, the outcome space could be many different things. It could be a space of possible statistics or sanitized databases. It could be policy decisions. It could be models that we wish to fit to the data. Many possibilities here. So what do I mean by masking small changes in the input database? Well, what's a small change? So what we're going to require as the analyst is we'll require that we obtain nearly identical behavior of our algorithms on neighboring databases. And so we'll get to nearly identical behavior in just a moment, but what do I mean by neighboring databases? 
So I mean databases are neighboring if they differ by the addition or removal of a single row. So X and Y are neighbors in this histogram representation if their L1 distance is less than or equal to one, okay? And now that we have this notion of neighboring databases, now we can get to the notion of differential privacy. So epsilon parameterized differential privacy for an algorithm which is a mapping between database space and an outcome space says that for any two neighboring data sets, meaning with that L1 distance in their histogram representations, and any subset of the outcome space of the mechanism that we might be interested in, the probability that our algorithm maps the first database into that outcome space is multiplicatively very close to the probability that our algorithm maps the second database into that outcome space. So let's spend some time with this definition because this is a definition we're gonna be using throughout the talk. We wanna be really comfortable here. So what does this really mean? So first of all, it looks a little bit odd at first blush. It looks like we have sort of an asymmetric definition. I put the x1 on the left-hand side and the x2 on the right-hand side, but actually because this definition needs to hold for any two neighboring data sets, it also must hold with x2 on the left and x1 on the right. So, so that's reassuring. And so, so if you think about what this is saying, this is a restriction on the distribution, the probability distribution induced on the outcome space by a differentially private mechanism. It's an epsilon parameterized guarantee where that epsilon is showing up in that e to the epsilon multiplicative factor that we allow in the differences in probabilities. But it's saying, for example, if you go point by point through the outcome space of the mechanism, that the probability mass that the algorithm places on that point needs to be almost exactly the same in this multiplicative sense under any two neighboring databases. So you can think of this already intuitively as a robustness or a stability notion for your algorithm. And if you prefer, feel free to think of that e to the epsilon as a multiplicative one plus epsilon. It's just fine. So let's lean on this definition a little bit more to get comfortable here. So differential privacy, for example, if we had a differentially private mechanism and we were running out on a database, for example, of medical information, what it would, and we were computing, say, the percentage of people in the database with cancer, uh, what differential privacy would say is if under a particular database, our mechanism induces a particular distribution over outcomes, then under any neighboring database, for example, by the removal of an individual, our me mechanism is restricted to induce a very, very similar distribution. And very similar has this particular sense of multiplicatively close probability masses. So that's sort of differential privacy from the perspective of the analyst. Now let's think from the perspective of a participant in the database. So an individual whose data is being used in a differentially private mechanism might have certain possible outcomes of the mechanism that she's concerned about. There might be potential models you might fit, there might be potential statistics you might calculate that would inconvenience her or that she suspects might make her insurance rates go up or might mean that her children will be discriminated against. Whatever it is that she's concerned about, there may be subsets of the outcome space that she's unhappy about. And what differential privacy tells her is, look, if we were gonna hit one of those bad outcomes with your data, we were gonna hit it with almost exactly the same probability without your data. Anything that we discover by, by way of a differentially private mechanism with you, we would have discovered without you. And the subtext there is, so you might as well participate. So you might as well tell the truth. And it's not just an informal subtext, this is something that we can formalize. So we can take a utility theoretic view of differential privacy by saying an individual I has preferences, which we'll denote by u sub i, over the space of possible future events. These are not outcomes of the mechanism. These are things that could happen in her life. And so she has some valuation over possible future events. Now consider two databases, x and y, that differ only in that i is contained in x, but not in y. And now think about 
the f, this, this function of the world, that takes the outcomes of the mechanism and maps them into a distribution over future events in this person's life. So think of this as there are two worlds, the two parallel universes. In one, the mechanism is run with her data. In the other, it's run on the same database but without her data. And then you look at the future distribution over things that happen in these two worlds. And we want to understand, is she much better off in the world where she didn't provide her data? And the answer is no. Just, if you just work through the expectations and the de use the de definition of differential privacy, her expected utility when the future events are drawn from f of m of x is very, very close, multiplicatively close in this e to the epsilon sense to her expected utility when future events are drawn from this f of m of y. So differential privacy very formally says it doesn't hurt you much more to be in the database versus not to be in the database. What it doesn't say is, it, is anything about whether or not the computation hurts you. It says, how much more does it hurt you? How much, how much does it change when you enter the database or leave the database? And this immediately, or almost immediately, gives a formal connection between differential privacy and approximate or asymptotic truthfulness guarantees. So if you're coming from sort of a game theory mechanism design background, there is a rich and really interesting literature that's been growing up in that space, making connections between privacy and mechanism design, doing differentially private mechanism design, thinking about the value of private information, quantifying the harm from privacy losses, thinking about compensation for privacy losses, it's all very interesting, I'm working in that space, but that's not the topic of this tutorial. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to get in touch, I can give you some pointers. There's a lot going on in that space, but I just wanted to hint at that connection. Okay, so now back to the definition of differential privacy. I also wanted to mention that we can relax the definition slightly and allow not just a multiplicative difference, but an additive one. So we talk about epsilon delta differential privacy where delta is now this additive difference that we allow in the probability masses. And you can think of this as basically you take an epsilon comma zero differentially private algorithm that has these induced distributions over the outcome space and you're allowed to throw some probability mass somewhere on there. And that extra probability mass doesn't have to obey the multiplicative guarantees. Now epsilon comma delta differential privacy is nice because it lets us do more things it's also strictly weaker than epsilon comma zero differential privacy. And to illustrate that, notice that when we're talking about just epsilon differential privacy with just the multiplicative uh, change in probability masses, we can never go from a zero probability event to a non-zero probability event. There's no possible outcome of an epsilon comma zero differentially private algorithm that's a smoking gun. Because any possible outcome under one database was a possible outcome under some other input database. Maybe it was slightly less likely, but there's no smoking gun. Whereas with the delta, you can have a smoking gun. And we tend in the literature to think of these deltas as being cryptographically small, although that's not necessarily sort of built into the definition. Okay, so now we have our definition of differential privacy. Are there questions about the definition? We're gonna get to properties next, but if there are questions about the definition, we should do them now. So let's continue on to talk about why we like this definition so much, some of its nice properties that will be really useful to us in building up our toolkit. So the first thing that I want to talk about is, so far I've talked about neighboring databases as differing in one person's information. But actually, differential privacy immediately and elegantly extends to talking about differences in k entries of the database. So you immediately get that anything that's epsilon comma zero differentially private is k epsilon comma zero differentially private for groups of size k. So if somebody's data actually appears in more than one row or she's concerned about the privacy of her family, something like that, small groups, just fine, no problem. You immediately get a guarantee. 
The thing that's really powerful is composition. So what, is, what do I mean by composition? So I'll state a, a simple composition theorem, and then we'll get to, to a stronger version of it a little bit later. But let's do the simple composition first. So what simple composition says is that if we build up a mechanism from a bunch of other differentially private mechanisms, that the built up mechanism gets immediately a differential privacy guarantee that simply sums the epsilons and the deltas of the mechanisms that make it up. So if we take k different mechanisms where mechanism i of that k has a, an epsilon i delta i differentially pri differential privacy guarantee, then the mechanism that runs all of those sub-mechanisms is sum over the epsilons, comma, sum over the deltas, differentially private. And actually, a much stronger theorem than this holds. I'm going to hint at, at one thing that can be strengthened here, and then we'll get to something else that can be strengthened in a little bit. But one thing that can be strengthened is that as I've written this, this doesn't show you that actually it's just fine if your sequence of mechanisms is adaptively chosen and actually uses the outcomes of previous mechanisms, for example, to select the next mechanism to run. It's also fine. You also get composition. So this, this is really the big deal. This is what makes differential privacy so powerful. Differential privacy is a stability notion, a robustness notion that gives you beautiful composition. And composition really makes differential privacy programming language for stable algorithms, which is really, really powerful. The next property of the definition that I want to mention is post-processing. And what post-processing says intuitively is if you do something that's differentially private, feel free to compute on that output however you want to. As long as those future computations don't go back and touch the original database, you can do anything you want to to the outcome of, of a differentially private mechanism, and you will do nothing to destroy the privacy guarantee. This is also really powerful. So formally what this is saying is if we have a mechanism that's epsilon delta differentially private, and we have an arbitrary randomized mapping that does whatever we like with the outcomes of this mechanism, then composing that arbitrary randomized mapping with the original mechanism, you still have epsilon comma delta differentially pri differential privacy. Now I write it this way and it seems obvious, but it's actually incredibly powerful. It means when you have something that's differentially private, it's differentially private forever. You can do something that's differentially private and you don't have to worry about what additional information the adversary will later discover. You won't have to worry about attacks that have not yet been developed. There's nothing that can happen down the line that will destroy the privacy guarantees that you're giving, the stability guarantees that you're giving. They're just there. They're properties of the mechanism that you ran to, to generate that outcome. And really, differential privacy differs from other notions of privacy in that it's a property of the mechanism. It's not a property of an outcome. You can't compute something that returns the number five and say that five is differentially private. The process that produced it is differentially private. And because we're talking about a property of the mechanism, we're in this wonderful situation where there's no need to model the outside information that might be available to an adversary. And there's no need to model an adversary at all. This is very, very powerful and very different from other notions of privacy. There are no computational or other assumptions that we make on an adversary. And so what you get is immediately, for free, you neutralize all linkage attacks including those made with future data sets that you haven't even imagined. OK. So hopefully now you're somewhat comfortable with the notion of differential privacy, which I'm trying to sell to you as a, a stability or robustness notion as well, and some of the properties of it. So now let's start to think about, can we actually guarantee this? And how can we guarantee this? So we'll build up a toolkit here, motivated in part by some applications. I want to give you a sense of some of what's been done in this space. 
So I'll start with something that really doesn't come from the differential privacy literature, but it's the first thing you might think to do if you wanted, as an individual, to guarantee yourself some privacy in the face of, of an analyst you didn't trust. Now, for the, most of this talk, we'll be trusting the analyst. And this is important. We'll get to later to, to what goes wrong if you don't trust the analyst or you can't trust the analyst. But for most of this talk, we'll be assuming that if the analyst promises she's going to run a particular computation, she's going to do that. And she's going to do that with access to true randomness. Um, if you don't believe the analyst or you don't trust her to see your data at all, though, what would you do? So let's suppose that you have a private bit and the analyst would like to estimate the prevalence of that bit in a population. So what she asks you as an individual to do, she's approaching you to participate in her study, she asks you to first flip a coin. If the coin comes up tails, you'll respond truthfully. If it comes up heads, you'll flip a second coin or flip the coin a second time, and you'll respond yes. If it's heads, you'll respond no if tails. So this is giving yourself privacy. It's giving yourself plausible deniability. Because if you say yes, and yes was the embarrassing bit, well, you could always claim it was because you got a heads and a heads. Perfectly plausible. Similarly with no. But in aggregate, the analyst is getting useful information. It's just information with noise introduced into each bit. And that's the idea of randomized response. So it's easy to do an accuracy theorem for randomized response, but let's see that actually randomized response gives differential privacy. So what's the idea here? What we want to understand for any possible outcome, what is the ratio between the probability that we see that outcome if your true bit is yes versus if your true bit is no? This is differential privacy for a database of size one. It's a little unusual. So what do we do? Well, we look at that ratio. And in this case, the probability that we get a yes, given that the truth was yes, is three quarters. Half the time you just say yes because you've got a tails, and a quarter of the time you say yes because you've got a heads heads. And similarly, the probability that you say yes given the truth is no is one quarter. And similarly, we can talk about the probability the response is no when the truth is no versus if the truth is yes. And in both cases, we get this ratio of three. And so, since this ratio of probabilities is bounded by three, our epsilon guarantee for differential privacy is log three. So there you go, you have your first differential, differentially private algorithm. And it's one you can actually run with the coin in your pocket. So, if we go back to trusting the mechanism, though, what might you do? So let's go back to sort of the perspective of the analyst, the trusted analyst, and let's say we're trying to compute a statistic. So we want to know the percentage of people in the database have, who have cancer. From the perspective of the analyst, you have all of this data that's been provided to you. How would you compute that statistic and release it in a differentially private manner? Well, we know you could run randomized response on everyone's behalf, but what could you do in a centralized fashion? Well, it seems intuitively perhaps obvious that what you would do is you would compute the st statistic and you would add some noise to it. And the question is, what noise with what shape and how much of it? So a notion that will be useful to us in understanding that question is the notion of the sensitivity of a function or a statistic that we might compute on a database. And when I say sensitivity, I mean how much can the value of that function change between any two neighboring databases. And this is a worst case notion. So we look at over all possible neighboring databases. Again, a neighboring databases are databases that differ in the absence or removal of one individual. We look over all possible neighboring data sets and we say, how much can that function change between any two neighboring data sets? And so this is a measure of how much any one person can affect the output of a statistic. And so, for example, for queries that return the average value of a linear query, so a linear query is something that maps a possible database entry, some one person's information, to a value between 0 and 1. 
And it's natural if you have such a linear query that you're interested in to find out the average value that takes over the data set. The sensitivity of such a linear query is one over the size of the database. Now this should sound familiar. What's a linear query? It's, just, it's a statistical query. This is the SQ model. We just call it something different in the privacy literature. But when you hear linear queries, think SQ. And also, when you hear count queries, which is another term you hear a lot in the privacy literature, think SQ. It's a restricted form. Count queries are just linear queries that map possible database entries to either a zero or a one, not a value between zero and one. They're counting the number of database entries that satisfy a predicate, that's all. So we understand now the sensitivity of, of linear queries and count queries, statistical queries. Now back to differential privacy. Well, it turns out that in order to guarantee differential privacy, like we said, compute the true value of the statistic and add noise. And the noise that you can add is scaled symmetric noise in the form of a Laplacian, uh, where the, the scale of the Laplacian depends on the sensitivity, that delta F, the sensitivity of the statistic, and the epsilon guarantee you wish to obtain. So now that we're starting to get epsilon guarantees, we have to think for a moment, are bigger epsilons better or worse to make sure that we're comfortable here? So bigger epsilons make the e to the epsilon bigger, which means that we're more permissive about the change that we allow in the induced probability distributions. So that means that potentially accuracy is easier, but it's a worse privacy guarantee. It's a worse stability guarantee. So just sort of a sanity check here. Um, so this is a mechanism for preserving differential privacy is this form of noise addition. So if you haven't seen a Laplace distribution, um, basically don't worry too much about the details. The two things to know are sort of what are the variance? What is the variance? Is this to be squared? Why are we talking about this particular distribution? Well, because it has the property that if you shift it over and you look at the relative probabilities of the two Laplace distributions, that they maintain this natural e to the epsilon ratio throughout their distribution, so, so throughout, the, uh, throughout the space. So it's, it's sort of immediately natural for differential privacy. But don't worry too much about the, the form of the distribution, and actually it need not be Laplace noise. We'll get to other forms of noise in a little bit. But the idea is we know now how to apply no noise in order to get differential privacy. So let's start playing with this tool. We have a hammer, finally. So if you have a single counting query, for example, we know that uh, counting queries that are averages have sensitivity one in n. If instead we have a counting query that takes the form how many people, not what fraction of people, but how many people in the database satisfy a predicate p, well, that has sensitivity one, because the addition or removal of a single person from the database can change that count by at most one. That's the sensitivity of this function. And so now we can add noise that's scaled by one in epsilon to achieve an epsilon differential privacy guarantee. What if we want to answer more than one query? Well, the natural thing to do is immediately to turn to composition. So we have a theorem that says if you do a sequence of things that are epsilon and delta differentially private, then the elta, epsilons and the de deltas add up. It turns out we can do better than that, actually. And a more sophisticated argument actually shows that if you do k runs of epsilon differentially private mechanisms, you get a, an epsilon prime k delta plus delta prime differential privacy guarantee for this really messy looking epsilon prime. And what do I want you to take out of that? The point of this that you should take away is that we see growth that looks like square root of k instead of like k in the epsilon. So that's kind of surprising. This is a powerful tool. This says that the epsilons don't just add up. You don't just get a k epsilon, but you get a square root of k. OK, so you could just go forth and apply your composition theorems if you wanted to answer more than one query. The question is, can we do better? Or how should we 
how should we think about handling more queries? So let's think about trying to answer a vector-valued query of dimension d. So think of that as uh, we have d queries that we wish to answer. And we could apply composition and add noise that scales as d sensitivity of f over epsilon, assuming that we wanted to get an epsilon comma zero guarantee of differential privacy. But that may not always be the best thing to do. And now I want to give you your first hint that thinking about a set of queries together can be much more powerful than simply answering them one at a time separately. And the idea is histogram query. So what do I mean by a histogram query? What I want you to do is I want you to answer how many people in your database are between the ages of 0 and 4, 5 and 9, 10 and 14, on and on and on and on. So, so I've binned your data set in, across some dimension, and I would like to know the count in every single bit. I'd like you to do that for me in a differentially private manner. And so as an analyst, you could, again, say, well, how many bins have we got? Let's say they're D bins. I'll apply my, my simple composition theorem and say that I need to add noise uh, that's a Laplace distribution scaled as, as D over epsilon. But you could be smarter and stop and think for a minute. It turns out you only need noise that scales as a Laplace distribution of one in epsilon, not d in epsilon, no matter how many bins you have in your histogram. And the reason for this is, if you think about it, the addition or removal of a person from the database changes the count in how many of these bins? One. And so actually, the sensitivity of this joint query, this histogram query, is still just one. And so you need to add much less noise than you might have anticipated had you treated the queries separately. So being able to correlate your noise or treat your queries together starts to look like a potentially powerful tool. Building up our basic toolkit, I also wanted to mention that you don't need to be wedded to Laplace distribution for your noise. Adding, adding noise in the form of a Gaussian also works. It gives you a guarantee of epsilon delta differential privacy. Adding noise in the form of a Gaussian is, of course, appealing because then privacy has the same, the noise for your privacy has the same type as other sources of noise. And when you add Gaussians, you get Gaussians. Uh, but it turns out, really, when we're talking about a large number of queries, you get the same cumulative loss under composition when you're doing the Gaussian mechanism versus the Laplace mechanism. So let's not worry too much about the, the form of the noise. So I've been talking a lot about answering queries, answering a single query, answering a sequence of queries. And if you're coming from a learning background, it may not be immediately obvious why I care so much about answering sequences of queries. So let me try to convince you this is something you want to be doing. So a query or a sequence of queries could be a statistic or a set of statistics on your database, but it could be much more. As I alluded to before, these linear queries or these count queries that I've been talking about and that I've been building up, they're SQ queries. And so a sequence of queries could be the sequence of queries you needed in order to run some sort of SQ learning algorithm. And basically, take whatever your favorite learning task is and think about how it interacts with the data every time it touches the data. Each of those interactions with the data is a query. And you could start to ask, how could I treat this sequence of queries in a differentially private manner? And all this talk about SQ queries is for a reason. Actually, most known differentially private algorithms use linear queries answered by way of the Laplace mechanism or the Gaussian mechanism, at least as a subroutine. It turns out that this basic model, which perhaps doesn't surprise people in the learning community, maybe it surprises us more, but actually most of what we know how to do boils down in some sense to doing SQ queries. 
I'll formalize the connection even further in a little bit. So it turns out to be tightly coupled there. Okay, but now I built up the basic tools. We have randomized response to the Laplace mechanism. We have the Gaussian mechanism. We have this notion of sensitivity. Now let's think about whether we can handle more queries and how we can do that. Because I, I hinted to you that treating a whole bunch of queries together and thinking about how to correlate the noise is potentially very powerful. Right, so you wanted to use your data for more than a handful of statistics. And maybe you wanted to use your data in a scenario where direct noise addition doesn't make sense. So what do I mean by that? Well, maybe what you wanted to do based on your data set was to select from among a discrete set of alternatives, not things that you can add noise to. Or maybe based on your data, you wanted to compute something numeric, but you wanted to compute something numeric where a small perturbation in that outcome space, in the, in the value that you compute, could be disastrous for your outcome quality. So uh, as motivation for the, this, think about uh, what you want to do is you want to uh, pick a price. You're in an auction setting, uh, you get a bunch of bids. Getting exactly the right price to maximize your revenue is great. Getting exactly the right pl price plus a penny could mean zero revenue. So you really don't want to add noise to some outcomes. What do you do when you're in a setting like that? So the key tool here is exponentially weighted sampling. So this gets known as the exponential mechanism, work of Nectarian Tawar. And the basic idea is you're going to select an element from the range of your algorithm with probability proportional to exponential of what? Epsilon, the privacy parameter you want to get. U of XR, we'll get back to what that means, over two times the sensitivity of that U. What was that U? U of XR is a scoring function. Think of it as telling you, given true input database X, how good is outcome R? And so what we're doing here is we're trying to bias and bias exponentially towards good outcomes over bad outcomes, given the true input database. So privacy is if you think about it for a few minutes, actually obvious here. If we move between neighboring databases, that's gonna change the score function by a most sensitivity of the scoring function. And so it's going to change the relative probability placed on a particular outcome by a factor of e to the epsilon. Just sort of intuitively. Privacy is, the privacy proof is really short here. Usefulness. So what's not obvious is have we concentrated our probability mass significantly enough on the good outcomes? And that depends on the application. And the sort of pairing of privacy utility is something that you should always be looking for when you're thinking about differential privacy guarantees. Getting strong privacy guarantees is actually always easy. Burn the database, output garbage. Privacy is easy. The question is, is meaningful private uh, computation possible? So what is the privacy utility trade-off? Or to ask the question in another way, how much data do I need in order to achieve a particular level of privacy and a particular level of accuracy? So it's this sort of pairing of questions that you should be looking for. <laughs> Perfect utility also really easy, just publish all of the data. It's, it's the tension, it's the trade-off that's interesting here. Okay. So I was telling you about exponentially weighted sampling, but you all have heard about exponentially weighted sampling before. You just saw it in a different context. So let me illustrate that context for you. You're in a world where loss vectors in the form of these L12 up to T are arriving online. Think about the set of loss vectors so far as a database and neighboring databases differ on any one time step's loss vector. Randomized weighted majority then chooses an action by exponentially weighted sampling. That is the exponential mechanism 
with quality score as the sum of the previous loss vectors and privacy epsilon equals to eta. The quality score has sensitivity one. So taking your eta as epsilon over two, you get epsilon differential privacy in a single run of randomized weighted majority. And you can apply composition theorems to get guarantees for the entire run. So you all actually came in the room knowing a differentially private algorithm. You just didn't know it, maybe. Randomized weighted majority is differentially private. So when I say exponential mechanism, just think this. You already knew it. OK, so why, why is the exponential mechanism, why is exponentially weighted sampling a useful and interesting tool? Well, one of the first ways that it was used was coming back to this question of how can we handle a really, really large number of queries? So what we'd like to do is figure out how to handle a really, really large number of these, say, linear queries that we were talking about, or these count queries. And it turns out we can use this tool to let us handle an exponential number of queries. And what I, get, what I mean by that, I'll get to in just a second. So we'll be thinking about these these count queries, for example, what fraction of people in the data are over age 50, what fraction smoke and have lung cancer, what fraction of males are over 150 pounds. We'll have some set of these count queries that we're interested in, and we would like to somehow answer all of them on the database, and all of them accurately. So the idea, the first idea for how to do this is just an application of the exponentially weighted sampling idea. So what we do, it's gonna be a combination of the exponential mechanism and a simple observation that should be obvious to all of you uh, of sample complexity bounds. So what do we do? We take that original database and we imagine all possible databases of a particular fixed size. And the particular fixed size that we pick should look familiar to you on the order of the VC dimension of a class of queries of interest divided by the square of the error that we're willing to tolerate in our queries. And what we do is we assign a score to each of these possible databases of this size. And the score is going to be telling us, worst case over all of the queries of interest, how much does the value of that query on the true data differ from the value of that query on this potential small database? And we ask that question over and over and over and over again. What's your worst query? How badly do you do on it? What's your worst query? How badly do you do on it? And we assign scores accordingly. And then we do exponentially weighted sampling according to these scores. So this, and pick something out, and that's our output of our mechanism. It's very simple. And this is pretty much immediately differentially private, and turns out, so I told you the hard question is accuracy, that it concentrates probability well enough in a good outcome. How does it do that? Actually, just by observing that there must be a good outcome by sample complexity bounds, there must be a small database that accurately answers all of these questions. And that turns out to be good enough for, for concentration of probability on a good outcome. So as I hopefully emphasize sufficiently, this is an information theoretic result. This is not an efficient algorithm, but it's a proof of concept. It proves that actually we can simultaneously get accurate answers to an exponential number of queries. And actually in doing so, we can create synthetic data. The outcome of this algorithm isn't just the answers to a whole bunch of queries, but it takes the form of data. It looks like data. It's a histogram over possible database entries. So it's, it's an interesting form of output. And so let's talk about synthetic data just for a moment. So synthetic data is nice because it's a succinct representation of answers to many questions. And it's, some, it's appealing in its sort of 
once and for all property. So synthetic data is something that looks enough like data that you could just publish it once and for all. And anybody can show up and run statistics on it. And like I said, post-processing is no problem for us. We can publish this stuff and let anybody do anything they want to with the data. The only catch is that they're only going to get an accuracy guarantee if they run a statistic that we anticipated and for which we gave an accuracy guarantee. So we had to define for this algorithm in advance the set of queries of interest. And we picked synthetic data that would support all of them. Feel free to run other queries on my data. I just won't guarantee anything about the outcome. So th synthetic data, though, is a powerful tool. So now I'm going to continue to push for a minute on this sort of buildup of answering many, many queries. But I wanted, as an assign, to mention something that's used, been useful intuition for me. Uh, when I think about big data, I think about data as being big in two dimensions. Maybe there are more of them. But more rows makes privacy easier. More rows is more people. That intuitively makes queries less sensitive. More columns makes privacy harder because you have a richer data set and there are more queries that you could wish to preserve. So big isn't what scares me. The richness scares me. Lots of data is great for privacy. So you see this as you start to look at the guarantees that you can get for differentially private algorithms. You start to see that the bigger the N, the easier, easier the privacy given a, an accuracy constraint. And sort of the richer the data, the larger the set of that capital X space of possible database entries, the harder the privacy. So there's, I'll give you sort of a brief history of synthetic data. Basically, starting with this information theoretic result, we as a community started to get really interested in this question of, is this the best you can do? Is this the most queries you can answer? Can we do sort of for a fixed accuracy guarantee, can we answer more queries? What about epsilon delta differential privacy? Can we do this more efficiently? And there's been a sequence of results in this space. There's still small open questions here, but this is something we basically understand at this point um, and spend a lot of time as a community trying to understand is how well can we generate synthetic data? And it's sort of what are the efficient efficiency considerations? What is the benefit of allowing ourselves this delta slack in the differential privacy? Guarantee. Again, remember, the epsilon is the parameter in the e to the epsilon multiplicative factor. The delta is the additive factor. We allow ourselves that additive difference in the probability distributions. So the, the takeaway from this history, though, is that sometimes you can do much better than naive noise addition with much more sophisticated techniques. So noise addition, that set of noise addition tools that I gave you at the beginning, where we're adding Laplace noise, we were talking about composition, uh, we were adding uh, Gaussian noise. Those are great tools, and sometimes they really are the best you can do. But for certain applications, you can really do much better than naive noise addition. You can answer many more queries much more accurately uh, with other techniques. So let me give you another take on synthetic data, another take on simultaneously answering a large set of queries that's more efficient, but gives you the same guarantee as that, that first uh, exponentially weighted sampling approach. And it also has a learning connection. So the idea here is that we're going to repeat three steps over and over again. We're going to start out with, we have our true database. We have a set of queries of interest. And we're going to start out with some candidate output database. It's going to be garbage at the beginning. Probably it'll just be, say, the uniform distribution of over, over all possible outcomes, over all possible uh, database entries. And so we're going to have to improve that. It's pretty bad, probably, for the input database and the queries of interest. How will we improve it? First, we'll say exponential mechanism. Find me a query of interest on which my current distribution over, over the uh, space of possible database entries does really poorly when compared with the true data. So find me a query of interest that's poorly served by my current approximation. And then I'd say Laplace mechanism tell me the true answer with some noise to the value of that query on the true private database. And then I use this measurement. So here's a query in which I'm doing poorly. Here's approximately the, the true answer on the, on the actual data. I'll use that measurement to improve my distribution using multiplicative weights update. Repeat. 
So again, now that I've updated, what's a query in which I've done poorly? What's the true answer with some noise? Multiplicative ways. You see here, privacy is, and the way we touch the data are just in steps one and two through the exponential mechanism and the Laplace mechanism. So the privacy analysis of this algorithm is really simple. It's how many times did you run those things? Apply your composition theorems. And the accuracy guarantee is also really simple. It's just the analysis of the multiplicative weights update. So it turns out this is a very easy, easy to implement way to answer a large number of queries and to generate synthetic data in the form of a distribution over the space of possible database entries. And it actually ends up running pretty well on real data. And it's something that you can run efficiently for many reasons uh, on pretty reasonably large data sets. So I've got to be honest, folks in the differential privacy community haven't run a lot of big experiments on big data sets. But to the extent that we have, there's actually more good news than you might expect. So what one of the things I want you to take away, though, from this idea of, of this mechanism for generating synthetic data that's useful for a huge set of queries is that it didn't need to be exponential weight, exponentially weighted sampling. It didn't need to be the exponential mechanism that I used to identify the queries on which the current hypothesis does poorly. It could have been any learning algorithm as long as it had a privacy guarantee attached to it. And actually what I've done here is I've reduced the problem of finding a query on which our hypothesis, sorry, I've done here is sort of highlighted that the problem of finding a query on which our hypothesis does poorly, our hypothesis being our candidate distribution over the space of possible database entries, it's equivalent to agnostically learning a query that fully distinguishes our hypothesis or distinguishes as best as possible our hypothesis from the true data. So I made a connection here between this problem of finding a bad query and the problem of agnostically learning for the space of, of queries of interest. Now, one thing that's nice here is that I only needed on the order of log of the number of possible database entries over the desired error bound squared calls to that agnostic learner, whatever it was. And what we see here is a hint of an equivalence that's, uh, that I find interesting, that the information complexity of agnostic learning is equivalent actually to that of query release, this problem of answering a large number of queries. So one thing that may have bothered you about these algorithms that I've given you so far for, for producing synthetic data that's useful for a large number of queries is that I required that you define the, the queries of interest in advance. People don't work that way. They don't know in advance what they're going to want to compute on their data. They want to compute one thing, see what the answer is, and then pick the next thing to compute. So how can we handle the set of queries online but still do something smarter than composition to correlate our noise to be able to answer more queries. So to run this kind of thing online, what you do is for each query that comes in, you do something like that HLM approach where we did the exponentially weighted sampling and a multiplicative weights update. But now what you do is for each query that comes in, you look at your candidate distribution and you see if you, you're currently doing well for that query on the candidate distribution. If you're already doing well with your current distribution, just answer that query with your current distribution. If your current distribution is one that serves this query, if the current query of interest in your current distribution are not a good match, meaning that query on the true data is very different from that query evaluated on your current candidate distribution, then you need to update. And so then, you save your multiplicative weights updates for those times when you get queries on which you're doing poorly. And what you, the reason this can work is that there's a technology base, uh, that you can use where the privacy hit that you take really depends primarily on the number of queries that are above threshold or queries of interest. And so for our purposes, this is letting us depend really primarily on the number of queries that come in on which we do poorly and we pay very, very little in terms of our privacy accuracy trade-off 
for queries on which our candidate distribution is doing well. So actually, we can handle queries and do our updates in this sort of uh, online fashion and produce synthetic data sort of at every point along the way that gets better and better as we handle more and more queries. So this is an appealing approach because it's interactive. You didn't need to know the queries in advance. And it's doing something that's really nice. It's managing, despite this, to correlate its randomness across queries on the fly. So I think it's a very powerful tool. All right. So this is actually a, an online learning algorithm in the mistake-bounded model. The queries arrive in arbitrary order and we must label them to make another connection. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time building up this toolkit motivated by query release and synthetic data, and it's a powerful toolkit, but let's talk a little bit more about learning and learning connections. So first, I want to say that differential privacy and machine learning are incredibly compatible. I've already been trying to push you to think about privacy as stability, as robustness, and these are things that as people interested in machine learning you probably already care about, but let me sort of push on this some more. Privacy and learning have the same goals, or at least similar, similar goals. We want to extract distributional information of the data. We don't want our results to hinge on the presence or absence of a few individual data points. It's the, it's the underlying distributional information that we care about, both in privacy and in learning. There are a lot of results on differential privacy and machine learning. I have a slide that throws up a sampling of them. I will be sampling the sample to give you a flavor of what's going on there and a starting place. But I think partially because differential privacy and learning are such a great fit there has been a lot going on in this space. Um, and one of the themes that I want to pull out for you is that commonly, differentially private learning can be done nearly as accurately with nearly the same sample complexity as non-private learning. So what I want you to take away is that in many cases when you're learning, privacy is basically free. I think that's very powerful and surprising. Okay, so one objection that you might have had sort of all along during this talk is that I'm sort of speaking in a different model than perhaps you're familiar with when you're coming from learning. Because when you're, when you're coming from learning, you think about your data as coming from an underlying distribution. And you don't wanna learn on the data. What you really care about is the underlying distribution. Let's start to address this question. This is a question we'll, sort of, or an issue we'll return to at the end of the talk. But so if you've thought about this, these things, you know that with high probability, if you have a database, it's a sample that consists of NIAD samples from a distribution, then for any F in a fixed class of queries that you might be interested in, we can bound the, the error that your sample has ver on any of those queries versus the true distribution by dependence of log of the class of queries uh, over n to the one half. And so to find a hypothesis with an error alpha of optimal on the distribution, you need to learn on order of log c over alpha squared samples. So, one natural question is, what if you want to privately learn? So let's talk for a minute about pack learning here. So it turns out that private pack learning is possible with polynomial samples if and only if non-private pack learning is possible with polynomial samples. And actually, the number of samples that you need is quite close. So private pack learning is possible within the order of log c over epsilon alpha com, com, max of that and log c over alpha squared samples. So if your epsilon kind of looks like your alpha, 
we're getting about the same sample complexity. The PAC result doesn't preserve computational efficiency. Um, so this is a result that we obtain by way of the exponential mechanism using a quality score that's just the fraction of samples that are misclassified by the hypothesis. But it's a sample complexity equivalent. So let's turn for a moment now to SQ learnability. So we already saw that statistical queries, they were just the linear queries. We were answering them left and right, and they're answerable efficiently by way of noise addition, for example, the Laplace mechanism. So we know how to answer statistical queries privately and efficiently. And we can talk about sample complexity. So for an SQ algorithm requiring M queries and alpha squared accuracy, private learning requires, sorry, alpha accuracy. Uh, private re learning requires max of m log m over epsilon alpha comma log m over alpha squared samples. So the log of m over alpha squared samples is the familiar part of this. The m log m over epsilon alpha is the unfamiliar, it comes from privacy part of this. And so this is not as good news, but in some sense this is saying that a hit, uh, the hit that you take for privacy is not so bad. If your epsilon is constant and your alpha looks something like 1 in M, then private SQ learning has the same asymptotic sample complexity as non-private SQ learning. So it's not as good news, but privacy may not cost you that much here. So now I want to draw another interesting connection. And this goes back to the question of trust of the analyst. So you remember the first differentially private mechanism that we took a look at was this randomized response. And this was provide your own privacy by flipping coins and adding your own randomness and giving a random answer to the mechanism. You didn't have to trust the analyst. You provided your own privacy and then she could do whatever she wanted to with your data. And if we're in a world where people don't trust the analyst and insist on providing their own privacy, we can try to understand what we can and can't compute in that world. What is, what is the power that we have in that world? And how does it compare to the centralized world where people are willing to provide their data to the analyst so long as she promises and delivers on this promise of doing something that's differentially private? So in this local privacy model, where people do not trust the analyst, but insist on giving themselves their own privacy through perturbation of the input they provide to the analyst, then proper SQ learnability corresponds to proper learnability in this local model. And this is equivalence up to polynomial factors in the database size and the query complexity. So SQ learnability Proper SQ learnability corresponds to proper learnability in the local model. Now this emphasis on proper raises the question of agnostic private learning. And it turns out that the queries that we can release in the local privacy model are exactly those that we can agnostically learn in the SQ model. And the queries that we can release in the centralized model are those that we can agnostically learn in the PAC model. So we see the private learning in the local model is not particularly limiting versus non-private or non-local, but query release is very limited in the local model. So there's this, this difference between private learning and query release in terms of these relationships and the role of the, the local model. So you already know from what I've told you so far the differentially private machine learning is possible. I mean, I told you, you already knew a differentially private learning algorithm. We've already seen how to do private learning from expert advice. That was this exponentially weighted sampling that you already knew about. Uh, but we can ask, take your favorite learning algorithm, can we make it private? And there's been a bunch of work in this space. And at a very high level, the question is, where do you put the noise? there's going to have to be some perturbation, some randomness, in order to get a guarantee of differential privacy. 
where do you put it in? And in my mind, there are three natural places you can put the noise. You can perturb the input to the algorithm, you can perturb the objective, or you can perturb the output. And all of these have been tried. Uh, all of these can be used to achieve differential privacy. The question is, what's the right approach for the, right, for the setting? And I don't have a very clean answer to sort of how, how to do, to take, take a, a new uh, learning algorithm that hasn't been studied yet, what's the right way to make it differentially private? I don't have a clean answer there. But one of the connections that I wanted to highlight is perturb the objective is something that probably sounds familiar to all of you. Objective perturbation is regularization. And so many people, when they see differential privacy and they're coming from a learning perspective, they see regularization right away. And yes, that's, that's, a, that's a natural connection. So in this form, you, privacy is a form of regularization. It's, an, it's necessarily randomized, but it is regularization. And you can see differential privacy as regularization by entropy. So that's a, a useful piece of intuition that you can lean on. So as I hinted before, there's been a lot of work on differentially private learning. And as I hinted, in many cases we've seen that privacy can come for free, or nearly for free. And that's, that's sort of the theme that I want to take away, but you should see that many of the things you might wish to do have been done, and, but despite that, there is a lot of room for further exploration. But there's been a lot of work specifically on the sample complexity of private learning, but also on producing differentially private uh, FVMs, doing empirical risk minimization, doing PCA, low, low rank ma matrix approximation. There's been some nice work there. So this slide is intended to be sort of a starting place. This is not everything that's been done here, but it's a good, good sample. Um, and if you have particular interests, um, feel free to reach out. But I believe the slides will be, or at least the, the video will be posted, so you should be able to come back to this if you're interested in seeing what's been done on differentially private learning. But hopefully, I've given you enough of a sense of the tools and the techniques that you should be able to come to these and see immediately, these are the pieces that went into making this learning algorithm differentially private. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to understand pretty quickly uh, how these algorithms were composed and sort of where the, where the randomness came in and how the privacy guarantee comes out. Okay, so now I want to get back a bit more to that story that I started to tell you at the beginning about how this isn't a talk about privacy, it's a talk about all these good things that we all care about together, about robustness, validity, generalization. And I want to start with a common response to learning about differential privacy on the part of people who you know, have some application in mind, which is, uh, it sounds great and all, but it seems like differential privacy would probably just add too much noise for my application. And I, what I want to say is that if you feel that reaction in yourself ever, that you really ought to stop and think about what that means. So differential privacy, as I've been pushing here, is connected to the robustness of a computation, to the presence or absence of a small number of individuals. And so when you're telling me that your computation is not compatible with differential privacy, well, there are a few things maybe you're telling me. Maybe you're telling me that your computation is not robust for one reason or another. And then I think probably you should worry. Maybe what you're really telling me is that, well, okay, it would be robust if you had more data, um, or you know, it would be possible that you could get better privacy utility trade-offs if you had more data. And then at least I think you should stop and think. And this is a useful lens for thinking about robustness and how much data you need to achieve a particular level of robustness. Or maybe your problem is, well, look, 
I don't think I could prove that my computation is robust on worst case data. And differential privacy is this paranoid worst case approach. Differential privacy requires robustness over any two neighboring databases, even totally bizarre ones that will never actually show up. And it makes this requirement over all possible outcomes, even the really improbable ones. So maybe you say differential privacy feels nice, but it just feels too paranoid, too worst case for you. And you expect that on real data, what you want it to do is actually robust. Well, if you're in that situation, we have some tools for you. And that's part of what I'm going to get through now. So before that, just as an aside, I want to say that pushing on differential privacy as robustness. Robustness in the differential privacy sense is not identical to other notions of robustness you might have encountered. It's not identical to robustness in the statistical sense. And one difference that's important to highlight is that differential privacy is worst case rather, rather than with respect to a distribution. But there are connections. And there has been work done on differential privacy for robust statistics. And I will mention that a, a bit later. So, but let's return to this situation where you expect that the study that you want to run is robust on the actual data. And the first idea that I want to highlight in this space is the idea of bootstrapping. So, What's the bootstrap aggregation idea? This should be familiar. Given a training data set, what you do is you create many new training sets of smaller size by sampling uniform with placement. You fit your model, or you estimate your statistic on each of them, and then you do some form of aggregation over the values. So voting, averaging, whatever it might be. So you might do, you know, you vote and for classification, maybe you average if you're you know, doing regression, and this idea that a robust statistic should be stable on most reasonably sized subsets of the data. And if the statistic is somewhat unstable, then aggregation should smooth that out. And if the statistic was quite stable, then the loss in precision from doing this computation on the smaller data sets and doing the aggregation should be pretty small. So that's sort of the intuition for why bootstrap Aggregation is a reasonable idea before we even start to talk about privacy. So now let's start to think about bootstrap aggregation for privacy. So the idea here is if you have a function that you want to compute, you have something you want to compute on your data, and you can't prove that it's low sensitivity, because in the worst case, it's not. There might be pathological neighboring data sets where the value of that function could change dramatically. But you suspect that it's usually stable on real data. It's not really clear what to do with that function if you want to guarantee differential privacy. But if you have an aggregation function, so something that would take a bunch of outcomes of that statistic and would aggregate them, if you have an aggregation function that preserves privacy, we can use that to make your non-differentially private function, whatever it was, differentially private by way of bootstrap. Because when you take your data set and you split it up into a whole bunch of different data sets, for simplicity, think about sampling without replacement or just sort of explicitly splitting up your data set. And you take your f, that function, that you just couldn't come up with a with a sensitivity bound on, or you didn't have a good sensitivity bound, and you compute that function on each of the smaller data sets, and then you aggregate the values of those computations. Well, if the aggregation function is epsilon differentially private, let's now look at the, the impact of changing or adding or removing one person from the initial database. Changing one of those database entries is going to change at most one of the sub databases, because for simplicity, I didn't sample with replacement. You can sample with replacement, not such a big deal, but let's keep it easy. Um, so we're going to change at most one of those smaller databases. And so we're going to be changing the values 
of at most one of these computations of your function. And so you can think of the computations of your function, those F circles, as being the database that's the input to your aggregation function. And your aggregation function is epsilon differentially private, meaning it doesn't change its value very much under neighboring databases that differ in one person's information. And that's exactly what we have here. And so your overall computation will be differentially private, even though you didn't know anything about the privacy, or you didn't guarantee anything about the privacy of your f. So bootstrap, which we call subsample and aggregate, is a really powerful tool for taking something that's probably stable on the actual data at hand and making it provably private, making it provably stable. So the good news here is you can use any differentially private aggregation function as long as your choice of the aggregation function didn't involve looking at the data. And private aggregation typically just requires you know, noise addition or, or it's something simple. And it, the sensitivity there that you need to scale your noise to is the sensitivity of the aggregation function. You don't ever need a bound on the sensitivity of the function whose value you're ag aggregating. And the privacy is immediate. So you set up this subsample and aggregate, you set up this bootstrap framework, and then you feel free to throw in whatever function you want to. You don't have to reprove privacy. Privacy just comes for free here. And so think about for, for aggregation functions, think about doing you know, an alpha trimmed mean where you discard the high and low values. Think about doing a Windsorized mean where you replace the high and low values with the extremes of the remaining data. Think about doing a median. These are all things that you can make differentially private without adding too much noise, and you could use them to aggregate lots of different functions that might be sensitive in the worst case. The bad news is that, well, you might have an interesting aggregation function, but it's hard to bound its sensitivity, and then you're kind of stuck, because we needed that sensitivity in order to get a guarantee of privacy. And the default bound is the maximum of its range, which is probably quite a bad bound. And the, the, but the real bad news here is that it, it's probably harder to prove utility guarantees for this kind of algorithm than it is for privacy guarantees. But if you were happy with doing bootstrap on your data before privacy came into the picture, then you're still happy doing it once I'm talking about privacy. So maybe it's not so bad. So to think about places this might be useful, well, this is a tool that ends up being really useful for differential privacy computation of statistics, statistical estimators. So think about maybe the, for example, the underlying function might be selecting the best model from among a set of M options. This sounds like something that might be difficult to do with privacy, but actually this is something where we have a very natural aggregation function that's differentially private. So we know how to do a noisy max or a, a noisy most frequent uh, winner uh, with differential privacy. And so we can pick the best model or the most commonly chosen model. Um, and similarly, we could output a set of significant features uh, using the subsample and aggregate framework. So these are potentially really really powerful applications. So then the other piece that I want to give you, if you're in this situation where you suspect that your data are well behaved and the function that you want to study is robust on them. So we have bootstrapping. The second idea that I want to give you is we could try to check whether your hunch is correct. We could try to check robustness before actually proceeding, but check in a differentially private way. So basically what we'd like to be able to do here is we'd like to be able to test in a differentially private manner whether a computation should proceed. And when I say should in this context, the question is whether or not a function of interest is actually robust on the actual data at hand. And if it's not, we'd like to say forget it. And if it is, we'd like to proceed. So in order to do that, a natural concept to introduce is the concept of local sensitivity of a function on a database. Uh, this is, I think I have the, the site on the next, on the next slide. 
I this seemed less hold, was holding for Bud Smith. So the notion of local sensitivity is take that notion of sensitivity that we had before. It was worst case over any two neighboring databases. So we looked at how much the value of the function could change over any two neighboring databases. Local sensitivity says, I'm interested in the sensitivity, but specific to a particular data set. So the sensitivity of a function on a particular data set says, how much can that function change between this data set and any of its neighbors? So I simply look at the, the databases that involve the addition or removal of a single database entry from the database at hand, and I say, how much can the function change between any of those two? Now, this is a measure of how much one person can affect the output on this data. And this sounds great. So if your function is terribly sensitive in the worst case, but you suspect it's not very sensitive on the data set of hand, what you'd love is to be able to take the local sensitivity and add noise that's calibrated to the local sensitivity. That sounds fantastic. Unfortunately, you can't do that. Don't go do that. Why is it a bad idea? Well, because the local sensitivity of your function could be sensitive. What do I mean by that? Well, the amount of noise that you add could actually reveal something about the data. And that sounds kind of intuitive. What I see is the sample from the noise. I don't actually see the noise. But if there were two possible inputs that had, for example, the same mean uh, value of, in the distribution of the function, but one had very high local sensitivity, one had very low local sensitivity, then seeing an outlier very far from the mean would hint to you that we were in the high sensitivity input. And so the amount of noise that you add can actually be revealing. And you have to be careful about this. So you actually need to smooth the noise that you add. So you can tailor the noise that you add to the local sensitivity, but you need to tailor it in a smooth fashion. So that the amount of noise that you add to a, a particular input database is not very different from the amount of noise that you add to its neighbors. So you can do tailoring to local sensitivity, but you can't do it naively. You need robustness of your local sensitivity. Another thing that you can do, though, is you can propose test release. And the model here is you propose a bound on the local sensitivity. I hope the local sensitivity of this function on my data is blah. You can test in a differentially private manner whether your actual data satisfy the bound. If your test fails, you can halt and forget about your computation. And if it passes, you can release that function with noise tailored to the local sensitivity. So by checking whether or not local sensitivity was actually stable on the data at hand, you are allowed to tailor. So as I've been hinting here, your test explicitly could be, what is the L1 distance to the closest database that fails the, uh, the local sensitivity bound? The sensitivity of this test of the local sensitivity is one. And so we could use this test in order to let us do tailoring of noise to local sensitivity. And so one other thing that's nice here is you don't need to get the local sensitivity exactly right. Any conservative bound on local sensitivity is just fine. Similarly, the sensitivity, or what in the literature gets sometimes known as the global sensitivity or the L1 sensitivity, um, is a fine bound on the local sensitivity. Feel free, as usual, to tell your noise to that. We're hoping to do better. But something in between is also fine. The bad news, of course, is that I, this isn't something that's achievable by way of epsilon differential privacy. This is something that sort of necessarily has failure built in as a, as a potential outcome. And you do need to be careful back here to do this test in a differentially private manner. And so you have some probability of getting the wrong answer to this test. Okay. So another observation that's a bit surprising that I wanted to make here is that 
sometimes you can get differential privacy without noise. What do I mean by that? So proposed test release can be used to privately check whether the distance to the nearest unstable data set is far, and if so, to release the true value of the function. Somewhat surprising. So let's talk again about robustness. So we've been dancing around this notion of robustness, and I, a couple of robu notions of robustness have really felt <coughs> relevant in our discussion so far. So one of them is robustness with respect to addition or removal of a few points from the data set. That is differential privacy's notion of robustness. The other one that we've been using indirectly is this notion of robustness with respect to subsampling. And this is also closely related to the notion of differential privacy. And sort of, I think it's useful to be aware of these sort of two threads of robustness that you're seeing sort of throughout the literature and the discussion here. So now let's talk about combining subsample and aggregate with proposed test release and the, the result that you get there. Um, so uh, work of Smith and Secorta show that you can modify the subsample and aggregate framework so that it outputs the true f of x with high probability when f is subsampling stable on x. And what this shows is that differential privacy only increases the sample complexity of model selection by on the order of log one and delta over epsilon. So really, they, they're getting accurate results. They're actually outputting the true f of x. They're getting very little hit in the sample complexity. And the hit that they're seeing is a problem independent, range independent hit. So as I hinted before, there's been a lot of work on differential privacy and statistics. There's going to be some overlap here in my mentions um, with some of what I mentioned in, in the learning section. Um, but there's, there's some really nice work making connections to robustness, as I hinted before. Um, statistical robustness is not the same as differential privacy robustness, but statistic, uh, robust statistics do seem to be very amenable to differential privacy. So there's work on interquartile distance, median, linear regression, uh, work on doing differentially private M estimators, uh, work that shows that basically for any estimator that's asymptotically normal on IAD samples, the differential privacy adds asymptotically no additional perturbation uh, versus non-private uh, estimators. Results showing that the convergence rate of differentially private estimators is tied to the gross error sensitivity. Uh, work on minimizing convex loss functions that might be familiar to some of you um, related back to the learning applications, as I hinted at model selection, um, and also some empirical work uh, on differential privacy and statistics. And I think there's really room for much, much more empirical work um, in this space. So now I want to return to another objection that comes up a lot when, uh, when folks are introduced to differential privacy, and it's, hold on, hold on, hold on. Differential privacy seems to want to put a barrier between me and my data and say that I can only interact with my data in this very restricted manner where I can issue differentially private queries or maybe I can get synthetic data, but I don't get to touch the data. And that feels wrong to a lot of people. I need to look at the data before I know what statistics I want to run. And looking at the data is not differentially private. And I would claim it's also just potentially questionable research practice if you're not very, very careful. But it's it pushes, I think, in a great direction, which is it encourages us to explore interactive or hybrid interactive, non-interactive mechanisms. So mechanisms where you don't need to specify your queries in advance, but you, you issue a query in order to look at the data. You see the results you get, and then you decide what queries to issue next. Or perhaps you spend some of your privacy budget, the sort of total privacy loss you're willing to take, you spend some of it on producing synthetic data, but maybe 
first you do some initial queries in order to find out what's interesting in the data set and what you actually want to preserve in your synthetic data. Then you maybe produce some synthetic data, but you save a little bit of budget for unexpected things you might want to explore after the fact. So, but it encourages us to think about interesting ways to split up our privacy budgets and to allow sort of rich interaction with data. And I'd argue that really we're moving to a world where people aren't looking at the data. People are doing statistics on the data. Big data force us to formalize what it means to look at the data. And if you have a lot of data, you're not looking at it. You're doing something with it. And if you can identify what that something is, then we can start to ask the question to what extent that something is compatible with privacy and to what extent that something is good research practice. Which leads naturally to some really nice work that I wanted to highlight, very recent, not yet published, on connections between privacy and statistical validity and generalization. And this is really addressing a very big question. So the theory of statistical inference assumes that there's a fixed collection of hypotheses to test. But then there's the real world. And all of these concerns that we have about the validity and truth behind so much of science that's being published today. Because of practice, data are shared, data are reused, hypotheses are chosen adaptively, and the theory of statistical inference doesn't know what to do here. Um, it just says don't do it. But it turns out, actually, that privacy gives us an answer here. That privacy gives generalization, and that tools from differential privacy give us a way to understand adaptive reuse of data and give us tools that you could think of as giving an exponential improvement in the number of reuses of a data set that you're allowed to do for statistical inference. So really, I encourage all of you to take a look at what's going on in this work. This is not a paper that's about privacy. It's a paper that's really about statistical inference and this fundamental multiple hypothesis testing problem that just happens to find that the privacy toolkit is, is the right one. So hopefully I've given you a little bit of justification for that story that I told you at the beginning. That this is not a talk about privacy, this is a talk about stability, about robustness, and a very powerful stability notion with great composition properties. And a very nice toolkit that should feel very familiar to many of you. Um, direct noise addition, understanding sensitivity or stability of functions, exponentially weighted sampling, synthetic data, and sort of the connections to learning in our between, between sort of our query model and, and learning, understanding the connections in the local privacy model where you don't trust the analyst and the centralized privacy model where you do, and seeing the connections there to SQ and path learning. And hopefully I've convinced you also that a lot of what you might wish to do in learning might be compatible with privacy. But also that privacy might be a useful lens even if you really don't care about privacy at all. Because that's really what I want to sell to you is that even if you don't care about anyone's privacy, the differential privacy is a really useful tool for thinking about the computations that you're doing, for understanding are they robust in this notion, and if not, why not? And potentially for helping you get much better control and formalization of generalization, for helping you get much better control and, and understanding of what's happening when you're testing an adaptive sequence of hypotheses on your data set and data reuse. And I think also the, this sort of last set of tools that I, that I laid out for you of subsample and aggregate and proposed test to re release and the connections there to bootstrapping should feel very familiar and ring a bell even if you really don't care about privacy. So 
In summary, I'd like to say that learning has been a really powerful tool for privacy, and I think it will continue to be so. Um, you saw this notion of exponentially weighted sampling, which you can think of as learning. You, you saw uh, the multiplicative weights updates show up. Um, we've, there are actually other connections and appearances of learning ideas, uh, not just the sample complexity type connections that I hinted at here, that show up in the privacy literature. So certainly there's been a rich flow of information in that direction, and there's, I think, a lot of potential in the other direction as well. And it, Privacy feels to me to be very compatible with learning. Really, the goals are the same. And I think privacy gives us a useful toolkit as learners. But the, in my mind, the biggest opportunity and the biggest hole here is that there's been relatively little contact between this literature that I've been describing to you and actual data. We try, but it's not our forte. And this is where you all come in, I hope. Because there's really, there's this chicken and egg problem as I see it, where there isn't ready to use commercial grade software that gives you these differential privacy tools. But that's because who would write it and who would use it? There's not demand. So we need somehow to get past this hurdle and I think that means getting some people interested in differential privacy who actually have data and starting to convince ourselves and our broader community, the folks who work with data, that having this toolkit would be really valuable and that thinking about privacy is not just about privacy but about so many other things. So I hope that one of the things that this talk starts is starts to get some of you who actually have data to think about doing some, something with your data that's differentially private, starting to think about some more empirical results, starting to think about some, some more ways of generating this demand, and potentially some collaborations that involve developing more robust, in the software sense, and uh, more sort of widely applicable software tools. And there are lots of challenges there that the differential privacy community is not set up well to deal with. And this is, I mean, this is a, sort of a point where I'm asking for help from all of you. Um, if you actually want something that's gonna stand up in the real world and give differential privacy, it's not just about proving the theorems, it's about concerns like floating point implementation issues that actually can uh, leak private information. And, and all sorts of things that I mean, this community does some of, but we need help making the leap. Um, so if you have suggestions or ideas for how to move this forward and how to sort of get past this chicken egg, and egg problem, I think there's a real opportunity here. Um, and I think there's a really useful toolkit here for this community. So um, I'd like to point you all to a number of resources. If you want just a refresher of what we've done in this talk today that gets through only some of the basic tools, um, I have a paper on privacy and database research that is geared towards social scientists, and so it's really accessible. Sorry, social scientists. Um, and so it's a, it's a nice starting point if you just want to see the basics. You also have two really great opportunities this week to learn more. Uh, so Cynthia Dwork, one of the founders of Differential Privacy, will be giving one of the invited talks at NIPS. It's at 9 o'clock on Thursday, I believe. Um, her, work, uh, her talk title is Privacy in the Land of Plenty. I believe she will be talking, uh, at least in part, about some of these results on generalization. There's also a Friday workshop on fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. And there's nothing about privacy in the title, or I think even possibly in the lineup. But I suspect that there are going to be some nice connections there to some of the issues I've been talking about today. Uh, so you have lots more opportunities here, but also feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'd be happy to connect you with resources and to, to take questions. Thanks. So by the talk, um, the talk very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for interesting testimony. Um, so, so I was curious about this um, 
queries based approach. So if you look from database uh, perspective, it's, it makes sense. But from a machine learning perspective, it's, it's kind of weird because mostly we're interested in like keeping the whole data set and then apply the machine learning algorithm on, on the data set. So in that sense, it's kind of, uh, so another scenario that, I mean, I'm not very familiar, but I mean, is to sort of come up with some sort of transformation that give you the sanitized data so that you can apply any learning algorithm on the data set. So that, I mean, you don't have to worry about modifying the, the learning algorithm. You just uh, focus on that transformation. So, so if, if you think about it, is that uh, in machine learning, what we actually care about is not the, the data for itself, but the similarity between sample. And so in some sense, it's, it's seem to be very easy to, to come up with this uh, transformation that preserve uh, some sort of privacy. But I mean, given the literature it didn't show, it seemed to be uh, difficult in practice. And do you have any kind of intuition why this is the case? So I'm not sure I got the core of your question, but let me try. So yeah. um, I think you highlighted that uh, there are a number of ways to approach uh, making machine learning differentially private. Um, one of them is to view your learning algorithm as a sequence of queries against the data, which it is, mm -hmm. and to think about how to make that sequence of queries differentially private. Um, and you can do that by enforcing privacy sort of for each of the queries. You can think about that as perturb the data first to get the privacy up front and then issue your queries after that. Or you can think about issuing the queries and then understanding how much you need to perturb the output in order to get privacy. Um, and it's not sort of, as I mentioned, it's not obvious to me that there's one right answer in terms of that approach. But it's important to be aware of the, the spectrum of possibilities. One, one that you were emphasizing is the synthetic data approach, which you can think of as perturb the data, perturb the input to your mechanism. Um, it's a, as I mentioned, synthetic data is appealing for a number of reasons and sort of this ability to produce the synthetic data, post it and have it available for anybody to do whatever they want to on it is, is very appealing. But I, I think I maybe missed sort of the, the kernel of your question at the end there. Well, well at the end is that um, if you think about most machine learning algorithms, um, they actually don't really care about the, the individual data but the similarity between the data points. So it seemed that, I mean, in some sense, it's already preserved the privacy, but given the long li literature that you, you get in the talk, it seemed to be very difficult in practice. So do you have any so, intuition? So I guess, I, I mean, some of what you're getting at is that um, many of the things we like to compute in the machine learning setting Right, they're, they're not about individual data points, which is why they're so compatible in some sense with differential privacy. Um, when, when you're doing PCA, it's not about any one data point, it's about some sort of signal that's inherent in the data set as a whole. Um, and so, in some sense, the, the issue that you're highlighting is really the fundamental compatibility between learning tasks and privacy, is that privacy is about hiding sort of differences from small perturbations in the data, and learning is about not caring about small perturbations in the data. So, so I think it's, it's really a, a fundamental com compatibility, but certainly there's, there's more room to, to build on these connections and to do more work on privacy-preserving learning. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks for the talk and everything. Uh, there's also been this recent work on like fairness in machine learning, and I'm just wondering, uh, my first question is if you are aware of, you know, of any uh, like um, simple but enlightening relation between those that you could share with us right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I think this is gonna come out in this uh, workshop. There is some work explicitly on uh, privacy as a tool for fairness. Um, and the, the title there is Fairness Through Awareness, if you wanna look up the, the site. Um, but I agree with you that it's, I mean, it's a big issue and it's one that some of us in the privacy literature are starting to think more about. I think both the privacy gives a toolkit there and that there are a lot of questions that weren't yet addressed. Um, so, um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the workshop, but I suspect it's going to be right on that target.
target. Um, so I wish I could go. I encourage you to go. Um, and I, I'm curious to, to talk to the organizers after the fact and, and hear what's going on there. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and so my second question is, uh, and I'm sorry if you addressed this earlier in the talk, I missed a little bit at the beginning, but um, thinking practically about applying this to you know, real questions of privacy, uh, just can you say what you think the most clear like, applications are and what some potential limitations of this would be to address real political issues of privacy? Uh, okay, so you want to to get back to sort of privacy in the real world. So I think the, yeah, this is a complicated issue. So I think that the way forward is a multi-pronged approach. I think differential privacy is an incredibly powerful tool. It's not the right privacy definition for every setting and every application, but it's an amazing starting point. And I think we need to find the real world applications where it's best suited and figure out what the barriers are to uh, getting folks in those domains comfortable with, familiar with, potentially even using the notion. Um, I've thought a, a lot about these sorts of issues um, and in particular with my interests in economics and game theory, um, I've thought a lot about individuals' decisions in whether they provide their data and how they're compensated for their data and, and how their data is used. And one of the opportunities, I think, is in places like data markets, where there is clearly a privacy concern to try to bake in not privacy, but noise, so that the stakeholders in these settings can start to understand the opportunity that noise might present it. And what I mean here is when you build a market for data to say, give people the opportunity to buy not the correct answer to their statistic, but a noisy answer to their statistic. And hopefully let them find that selling noisy statistics is profitable and buying noisy statistics is useful. And that potentially sort of opens the door for privacy. So that's sort of one, one of the many approaches. I think there's, there's a role for regulation. I think there's a role for government. I think there are a huge number of barriers, including the, the fact that the way that people make decisions about data right now is not very smart. Um, and people don't value your data. And you can run all sorts of interesting but and funny and sad, but not necessarily very useful experiments showing how much people will, will give away for how little, and it's atrocious. And it, one of the challenges here as somebody who's a little bit a social scientist is that this is a, a setting where we don't want to model, or at least I think we don't want to model how people make decisions. I think we want to change how people make decisions. Uh, I think we want to put them into a world where they have better options in front of them and where they can learn to expect better options, and where they can learn to reason about better options. But in order to get to that place, we need the foundations. We need to know what better options are. And so it's a funny place to be in, and it's, it's a really challenging place to be in. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I, just, I have one little point of clarification that I didn't quite understand your answer, which is uh, when you mentioned noising the data, you said not making it private, but just adding noise and letting companies and people see that this noisy uh, statistics are still profitable. I mean, that just sounds like differential privacy to me. I mean, yeah, but I, I think <laughs> the, the point there is don't present it as privacy. Okay. Don't do it because sure. it's privacy. Right. Do it because it's profitable. All right. Do it because it's useful. Yeah. And then that gets maybe a foothold for privacy. But th that knob should not say privacy on it. All right, right. Thank yeah. you very much. Sure. Uh, let's turn over to the other mic. So you, you talked about the relation between stability of learning algorithms and, and differential privacy. Uh, now, stability of learning algorithms, that goes back a bit, a bit further, I suppose. Um, but your definition of sensitivity, that looks much like what people were doing there. So do you view differential privacy as subsuming the, this prior work? Is this like? So, I, so as far as I know, the notions of stability that I'm familiar with from previous literature are not identical to differential privacy as a form of stability. Um, 
and in particular, I don't know of previous notions of stability that have the same sort of composition uh, guarantees that we see with differential privacy. This is not to say that other stability notions aren't useful or, or valuable, but I think the differential privacy is a particularly powerful and attractive notion of stability. Um, so if you use or like stability somewhere, I'd encourage you to think about whether or not this notion of stability is powerful and useful for you. So, so in particular, you, you talked about the exponential weights algorithm. Yeah. So I work in online learning and wondering now whether I should try and understand that algorithm in terms of its differential privacy, because there's such a a clear relation there. Absolutely. <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think uh, I think it, it it's very informative to revisit these things that are very familiar through this lens and try to, to try to understand uh, this notion as stability, as robustness, as generalization, as all of these things that I've tried to, to push it at. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I'd like to thank you for your very illuminating talk. Um, <clears throat> so I work on Markov processes and in metrics between Markov processes. And it seems to me that um, the concept you have here is some kind of smoothness or possibly continuity or Lipschitz property. Is, can it be formalized like that? Absolutely, yes. Yes, yes. So another way to put it is that it's a little So it can be property. done on arbitrary metric spaces, not just on these collections of databases? So, so yeah, there's, there's room for that generalization. Um, it's not something I've really thought about the consequences of. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely a Lipschitz property. OK, so let me just uh, sneak in another question. You use this phrase somewhere in your talk about a programming language for privacy, something like that, when you were talking about for compositionality. For, for stable algorithms, So I was wondering, yes. is that a figure of speech, or is there actually a programming language? It, it's it's, it's a figure of speech, but a, a temp, a attempting, and it's actually not my own phrase. I should credit, to, credit it to Aaron Roth, who used it recently. Um, I, just this idea that I, privacy, privacy is really giving you I, this, this amazingly powerful way of getting stability that fits together so nicely. And it's going back to this composition and this post-processing. This is, is it's a very, very powerful stability notion. Um, and it, it has a lot in common with a language, but it's, it's not, there's not something explicit about the connection. Perhaps there. something to explore. Perhaps. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> uh, so your notion of uh, statistical inference was uh, only frequentist, right? Um, but it seems that uh, Bayesians also have a very interesting sort of notion of uncertainty, the posterior distribution over queries. So is there any work in this space? Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, perhaps I should have mentioned, um, you can take sort of a, a Bayesian approach to understanding just the, the privacy definition and thinking about uh, the, the change in a posterior when you view the outcome of a differentially private mechanism and the impact that it has on your view of the world. Um, so there's a natural an analogy there. Um, I think there, there's not been a, a lot of work pushing in that space, but I'm not quite sure where to push there. You, you could imagine just sampling from your posterior as sort of adding quite the right amount of noise, right? So is there a relationship between, I mean, is your posterior actually, you know, the, how differently private is your posterior in some sense? Right, sorts? right. Um, so, so sampling from the posterior is not gonna be sufficient on its own for differential privacy, but it's very close. Um, and so, so that's something that, that one could explore. It's not something off the top of my head that I, I know the answer to, but certainly, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering if I look at this from an unsupervised learning with reconstruction error kind of perspective, um, that seems to be quite tricky because kind of your query seems to include the parameters or whatever you want to learn, or I'm not sure how to see this. So is there like a special branch of this whole theory, how to deal with these kinds of problems when you have like reconstruction error with latent variables point of view? So I'm, so I'm not an expert there, so I'm not sure I'm getting the question quite right. Um, can you try to rephrase um, the outsider? So 
if I, if I think about it in an, I, w I have a learning algorithm that wants to reconstruct the input data or that wants to predict some kind of uh, uh, um, property of individual data points actually, or not so much of um, uh, like aggregate statistics. Is there a special branch, a special set of tools that you maybe can use to make this better feasible? So again, not as an informed insider, but as an outsider, that sounds perfectly at odds with differential privacy. Uh, so differential privacy is really about being insensitive to the presence or absence of individuals and not allowing reconstruction of uh, individual data points, but only allowing reconstruction of properties of the entire data set. So it sounds more than anything like there's an impossibility theorem waiting to be <laughs> to written, written down there in that space. Um, just to comment on that, you can view uh, the reconstruction, the, f the function that does the reconstruction is what you're actually learning in that case. Uh, so it's not, it's a function that takes anything in the input and, well, from the data space, which is presumably a, a sub-manifold of the input space, um, and reconstructs it. So um, I think it actually would be compatible, essentially, in that sense, because you don't need to, like, reconstruct every point perfectly. You just need to capture this whole space that the data lives in. That's like the goal of these okay. algorithms in general, I would say. Okay, all right. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Oh, okay. All right, let's thank you for the presentation. Thanks, Sarah.